graduate students and early career people. So thank you for coming. And uh, maybe I can just put a little plug for the next two sessions that follow this. We hope that you'll hang in there with us. The business meeting follows this session and then we have um, a social. If you decide not to attend the business meeting, we hope at least you'll come back and join us for, for the social. I have the distinct privilege of introducing Dr. Karen Harris, our past president. Um, Dr. Harris is the Mary Ellen Warner Professor in the Mary Lou Fulton Teachers College at Arizona State University. She's worked in the field of education for more than 40 years. And I feel okay saying that because you did yesterday <laughs> and it's on your website. Um, and it's, I think, a remarkable and she's worked as both a general and special education teacher and, of course, um, as an esteemed academic. Dr. Harris's contributions to education, particularly special education and educational psychology, are too numerous to list here um, if I want to give Karen any time to talk at all. Um, so what I'll do is just mention a few highlights, uh, particularly those that relate to the work of Division She's a former editor of one of our flagship journals, the Journal of Educational Psychology. And she's also uh, the, was the editor um, of the Psychology, American Psychological Association's Educational Psychology Handbook. She is a lead editor, along with her husband, Steve Graham, of What Works for Special Needs Learners. And that's a series that's published by Guilford Press. Dr. Harris is a fellow of both the American Psychological Association and the American Educational Research Association. And she's recipient of numerous awards, including the Career Research Award from the International Council of Exceptional Children, the Samuel A. Kirk Award from the Division of Learning Disabilities, and the Distinguished Researcher Award from the Special Education Interest Group of the American Educational Research Association. My introduction to Dr. Harris's research was in the mid-1980s when I was completing my master's degree at Simon Fraser University. And if, for those of you who may not have been, uh, well, probably not in school, maybe some of you at that time, um, I always think of that as really the heyday of strategy intervention research, um, which really was the foundation for a lot of the work that we do in self-regulation today. Dr. Harris, along with her collaborators, people like Steve Graham and Michael Presley and Bernice Wong, were really the pioneers in that field. And so they really have laid the groundwork. Um, and of course, our leaders, Karen is a leader um, to this day in the field of self-regulation. Perhaps she's best known for her development of the self-regulated strategy development model, which I think is one of the most extensively researched interventions that is designed to support children's self-regulation in mainly writing, but also they've done research on reading, math, and homework. <clears throat> Throughout her teaching and research career, Karen has remained committed to improving teaching and learning in highly diverse contexts, and particularly for students who struggle to learn for one reason or another. Karen, it's been a pleasure to work with you these past two years on the divisions Executive Committee, and it's a great honor to introduce you and your presidential address. That was a really nice introduction. I asked for a hand mic because I'm not really good at standing still, and I'd actually much rather be down there if they didn't have one. So I'm going to do the best I can to stay up here. Um, it's wonderful to see so many friendly faces in the audience. We have a really nice mix of senior scholars, doc students, and early career scholars. And a few of the slides in here are specifically here for you, docs and early career. And um, I'll point those out. Well, you'll to know. But um, I really thought a lot about not just talking about my work, but how could looking at the work we've done be informative to earlier career scholars? How could it be useful to you? So let's start with the first confession. The first confession is that it's complicated, and I'm not even talking about SRSD yet. Let's talk about writing. After a long, hard day at work, how many of you go home and for relaxation, entertainment, or pleasure, you read? Is there anybody in here who does 
Let's and breathe for relaxation. Entertainment. Okay. How many of you, after a long, hard day at work, go home and you, for pleasure, entertainment, to learn, or for relaxation, you write? I'm not going to get even one hand. I usually got a couple. Usually people who like to walk or do poetry. Those are the big two. My opening point is they aren't the same. Writing is an incredibly complex capability to develop. It requires extensive self-regulation of a problem-solving activity. It requires goal deduction. It requires a great deal of knowledge. Now, a lot of my slides have a lot of information on them, and I have absolutely no intention of reading them to you. The information's there. If you want all the slides, let me know. I'll send you the PowerPoint. I'm going to hit high points because you can read faster than I can talk. But teaching writing is as demanding as the act of writing. And what we're going to see is that teachers in our country are typically poorly prepared to teach writing. And recent research shows that the lower a teacher's efficacy is for writing themselves and for teaching writing, the less time they spend on writing and teaching writing and the less they enjoy teaching writing. So when you put all that together, that's not a very hopeful package. We also have, we also have to consider writing in many forms. It's a process, it's a product, it's a way of knowing, it informs development and instruction, and it allows us to engage with community, and it allows self-discovery. Now, even for skilled writers, writing isn't easy. I love this quote. This is Kellogg. Uh, he was a famous sports writer, I believe. He said, writing is the mental equivalent of digging ditches. I feel like that. You feel like that? Writing a vein is simple. Just sit down at the typewriter and open a vein. Writing a vein. Writing is simple. Just sit down at the typewriter and open a vein. Now, these days it's a keyboard, but it works. Writing is no trouble. Just jot down ideas as they occur to you. The jotting is simplicity itself. It is the occurring, which is difficult. And my favorite, every sentence is like pangs of birth. Now, I don't know how he would know. But I don't appreciate the metaphor. So let's look at a few things about skilled writers. We actually have a fairly good database, informative base on skilled writing. We know that skilled writers are great at making, organizing, changing, adapting their goals as they go along. They have simple goals, that, and they have advanced and complex goals. They have a rich store of knowledge across genres and across writing as a process and writing as a task. They have patterns and schemas they can modify, adapt, play with. They're sensitive to audience. They think about their knowledge of topic. And let's look at that last one. They use effective self-regulation procedures throughout the recursive writing process. That last one can't be so complicated. All right. Several people have taken a look at exactly what self-regulation processes are required in writing. Here they are. It's not such a big deal. Knowledge about oneself as a writer. Skills, abilities, strategies, mastered or emerging, knowing the task, the genre, the mechanics, the form, the skills, the strategies, knowing your own affect about writing. How many of you get tired of writing and wish you could quit? And you have little, little tricks to keep you going? I have, I have this little chant, you know, five pages and I can have a glass of wine, five pages and I can have a glass of wine. <laughs> it used to be if I finish these lesson plans, I can have a glass of wine. <laughs> Um, we have to evaluate the writing test. We have to determine our goals. We have to determine strategies. We have to select among alternatives. You're reading ahead of me. We manage cognitive load. We use tools. We manage affect, attentional control. We manage time, and we also manage environment. So it is kind of a big deal. I don't want to try and say reading is harder or writing is harder. My point here is they are different. They have an intertwined base. One informs the other, but we have spent far too long thinking that if you can read, you will write. It simply isn't true. I'll show you some data. Let's look quickly, let's have a little fun too. Let's look quickly at some examples of failure to self-regulate while writing. 
These are all real. These are eighth graders, most of them. Homer wrote the Odyssey, in which Penelope was the last hardship that Ulysses endured on his journey. Hmm. We really thinking about the sense the reader's going to get out of this? Are we checking accuracy? Not so much. Socrates was a famous Greek teacher who went around giving people advice. They killed him. Now, I don't think he meant to be funny. There's actually some accuracy in that, but the way it comes off is not quite right. Bach was the most famous composer in the world, and so was Handel. Handel was half German, half Italian, and half English. Wait for it. He was very big. All of those halves. And one of my favorites. Milton wrote Paradise Lost. And his wife died, and he wrote Paradise Regained. <laughs> All right. We can give lots of examples of poor self-regulation in writing. We collect them. A man named Letterer writes books where he's collected them. Teachers have collected them and given them to us. Uh, they do sometimes perhaps show us maybe what's a weaknesses in instruction that might be occurring as well, but I've been in excellent classrooms with excellent instruction and still seeing this kind of writing come out in the end. Let's look at the importance of writing. It is the neglected art. We've had, I think, four or five now National Commission reports, different organizations on writing, and they all come to the same conclusion. We're in trouble. Writing is how students connect the dots. It's the most common way students demonstrate what they know after third grade. Now, in, let's fill in the blank. See what you think goes here. In elementary, middle, and high school, the two most powerful predictors of academic success <coughs> are blank and reading comprehension. Yes, now you know, because I'm up here and it's my blank, what goes there. <laughs> but most people want to put math there. The data says writing. Writing is a powerful tool. The statistics are distressing. More than 90% of white collar, and now more than 80% of blue collar workers' jobs involve writing. There's no such thing anymore as a profession that will give you a decent standard of living that doesn't involve writing. Jobs require, on average, a higher level of literacy skill than they did just 10 or 20 years ago, and the trend is accelerating. Higher and higher literacy demands. Look at what today's mechanics have to be able to do. Have you seen the mechanics manual? Have you seen the computer graphics and displays they have to deal with? Do you know any of what they have to write when they're doing an evaluation? Lack of confidence puts our kids and our young adults at risk. How are we doing? Two out of three students don't score at the proficient level on the NAEP. The NAEP data show that in writing performance, we have stayed flat for decades. Students with disabilities and English language learners are even worse off. Only 5% perform at the proficient level and only 1% at the proficient level, respectively. This one really, really bothers me. The class of 2012 attained an average score of 488 on the writing portion of the SAT, the lowest score since that test was introduced in 2006. Now, yes, they've made changes. They have gone to great lengths to try to make the Scales equivalent, $2 billion is spent every year on remedial courses for post-secondary students. When I became a university professor in 1980, there were very few four-year colleges that had writing labs, remedial writing labs or writing development centers. Every single four-year university in this country today has a writing support program. writing, and almost one in every five first-year college students requires significant assistance in writing. Now, some of this does have to do with the kind of instruction and the kind of attention writing has gotten in our country, and it turns out across most of the uh, industrial world for the last 20 to 30 years. First of all, we support these changes, these underground, underlying principles for effective writing instruction, many of which have emerged from writing uh, the Writer's Workshop approach, Readers and Writers Workshop, the National Writing Project, and Whole Language Approaches. Every one of these is important. 
you're reading ahead, let me just tell you that I think interactive learning is foundational. We'll see where that fits in SRSD. Creating that writing community is a central component of SRSD. And this knowledge, strategy, skills, and mechanics in the context of meaningful writing is also critical to SRSD. And it's that last one, knowledge, skills, strategies, and mechanics that writers workshop and whole language typically fail to address adequately. Now we have enough data on writers workshop to make a definitive statement. The process approach is not very effective for children in general. There are children, cases of kids who do very well in whole language, reading and writing. Our daughter was not one of them. We taught her to read after they told us she probably had LD. She didn't. She had some attention issues, but she didn't have LD. She went to a whole language school where they told us that by second grade, all the students were miraculously reading and writing. So we kind of held back and didn't try to teach her and let the school do its thing. And at the end of kindergarten, beginning of first grade, they said, well, we're just not really sure she belongs here because she's not reading or writing yet. So we had her assessed, and the assessor looked at us and said, after doing a full-blown expensive assessment, by any chance is your child going to a whole language school? <laughs> and we said, yes. And she said, well, and we said, okay, we'll teach her. So what we know about whole language and the writer's workshop, it can work, and the reader's workshop, it can work for some students, but most students need more. Many of them get it at home, particularly in reading, or they get it from tutors or after-school learning centers. This private school our daughter was going to, this lovely, wonderful school in so many ways, the trick of all the kids reading by second grade was, as we learned by second grade, if you weren't reading, you were gone. Pretty easy to have a school where everybody's reading by second grade if it's not your fault and there must be something wrong with the kid and so if they're not reading, for struggling writers, workshop has uh, no effect. This is based on uh, meta-analyses. Uh, let's have another confession. SRSD owes so much to so many. I am only going to be able to hit a little bit of the foundations here and a little bit of the continuing influences. In 1982, I published my first paper, paper arguing to integrate knowledge across theories, affective, behavioral, cognitive, and additional evolving theories. SRSD is the direct result of work by hundreds of scholars, including many people in this room I can point to and name, and you know who you are, and Nancy may have been reading my work, but I've been reading her work for years and years, and there's people back here whose work I've read for decades. It belongs to all of us. I may have been like the engineer who put the pieces together, but this field, our fields, created all the pieces. So it belongs and is, is a, an accomplishment of all of us together. Serendipity played a large part in SRSD coming to be. I'd like to say I had a plan from the beginning, but that wouldn't be true. I was a teacher. I taught in a coal mining community in West Virginia. I taught fourth grade. Before that, I had taught kindergarten. I was teaching the coal miners' children. I was in a very low SES uh, community, mostly African American. I learned a lot about what children in poverty don't get and what they need. Um, I learned a lot teaching kindergarten and student teaching in urban settings. And then I taught special ed. In the, this was all in the, in the 70s. In 19, uh, late 1970s, I started my doc degree. And my assignment was as an RA in ed psych. My degree was in learning discipline but my teaching assistantship was in Ed Psych. I taught four sections a quarter of Intro to Ed Psych. At least it was one course, one prep, <laughs> and there were a team of us. We each taught our own classes, but we evolved materials together and worked closely together. We had leadership of a senior faculty member, and I used Beatler's book. Now for you early career people, I highly recommend going back to a library somewhere and getting Beeler's textbook back from the 1980s. He was one of the first to write a textbook for teachers and teacher development that integrated across theories. He argued and gave examples for how behavioral theory, affective, emotional, social theories, and 
cognitive theories all inform teaching in important ways. Now, I was teaching this over three years, most of three years, I was teaching 12 sections of this a year. By the end of three years, I was pretty brainwashed. I had convinced myself really well that these theories didn't have to be seen as incompatible and competitive, but rather there was a way to integrate them in the classroom. Now, I read a book by a guy named Dubin called Theory Building, and I read Michael Mott's book on cognitive behavior modification toward the end of my doctoral degree, and I became a theoretical integrationist. That's something I'll define in a little bit. And then I met Steve Graham. Now, I was all about instruction. My early, my first two studies were all about putting together an intervention that would address cognition, affect, and behavior based on research, based on evidence-based practices, and would be in problem solving, and it was successful. It worked well, uh, but I wanted to move on into academics. I wanted to do something in academics, and I didn't really know what I wanted to do. My passion was instruction. How do we improve instruction? And that's Steve Graham. His passion was writing. He was just ingesting everything he could find on writing, the writing process, the genres, genre study. He was really deeply immersed in that literature. We got married and SRSD was born. <laughs> That's how it came. And along the way, I had some awesome mentors. So I designed SRSD, and I've continued to lead in its revision and continuing evolution. But Steve and I have been partners through all of this, and he has typically been the primary designer of the writing elements and the writing strategies within. Now, over 30 years, our roles have become much more mixed, but that's how we started. My mentors early on were people like Bernice Wong, and Barbara Keogh, and Donald Deschler, um, and so many early strategy researchers. Donald Michael became a mentor and a friend. And without those people, it just wouldn't have happened. So what is SRSD? Well, first of all, we're developing in tandem ownership, not mimicry. We don't want robotic, formulaic writers. We don't want kids who just engage in a formula and go do 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 and they're done. I'm going to show you some writing you see if it looks formulaic to you or not. We want kids who own strategies, strategies for writing and strategies for self-regulation. Now, in the first iteration of SRSD, it wasn't called SRSD. I'll show you what it was called in a minute. Um, that relates to a different question. And I had not adequately addressed the kid's con cognition and emotion. Now those go together, that's why I'm saying both. It might sound more like emotion to you, but emotion drives a lot of cognition. So I have Eric Anderman, a whole bunch of other people in the audience. And, I mean, to go look at their work. We know the two are not that separable thing that we used to talk about the best. So we were working with kids who were struggling in writing by third and fourth grade. Got this one little boy to come and work with me. Uh, at this point, I was doing all the instruction myself in the 80s, and I said, I've got these great things to teach you. I know you've been having trouble with writing, but you know, I think that there are two reasons, and to this day, we still talk about these two reasons. There are two reasons you're having trouble with writing. Now, I have to be careful who I say this to, because if I'm not right, I'm setting up worse failure. There are two reasons. One, you haven't been taught some of the most powerful tricks for writing. Now, the little kids, we call them tricks, but the older kids, we call them strategies. And I have learned some really powerful tricks, and I will teach them to you. But two, you have to put forth effort to learn those strategies, and you have to put forth effort to use those strategies, because it won't work if you don't put forth the effort. And I show them writing by other kids their age who've done the strategies, and they almost uniformly agree. But about my fourth little boy, he said, okay, I'll try this out. And then I said, great, we're going to start with words, and we're going to learn how to make words a really fun part of your writing. It was a real simple strategy just based on vocabulary, one of our earliest studies. But I made the mistake of saying, we're going to learn how to play with adverbs, adjectives, and nouns in your writing. And he shut me out. He said, I failed that in English. I'm no good at that. I can't do that. I won't do this. And you can't force anybody to be self-regulated. You can't force anybody to be strategic. If they're not willing to engage in learning to do so, you can't force it on them. I said, okay, you don't have to be here. Now, in today's IRB, you have to do that anyways. 
I took him back to class. A few weeks later, he said to me, as he was seeing other kids coming back and sharing and really proud of what they were doing, he said, you know, maybe I could try working with you if we could work on something different. And I said, okay, how about if I taught you how to use describing words and action words and words that also describe action? You know what I'm talking about, right? And he said, okay, that didn't sound so bad. And he did it, and he did quite well. And then at the end, I took him down to see his teacher, and I said, there's something you need to know. What you've been calling with me, describing words, those aren't adjectives. And on and on. And he looked at me, and he goes, you lie. <laughs> <laughs> and he stopped before he could get that all out. And the English teacher looked at me, and she said, no, Benjamin, no. She's absolutely right. See, you can do it. So for him, it was a matter of those words had become intimidating. The failure to be able to do that in the classroom had become so impeding that he wouldn't try. He wouldn't give it a try. All right, now this is the point where I'm going to pick up a lot of speed. I'm going to go pretty fast. And if you have any questions, I'm going to try to leave some time at the end, but please feel free to also ask questions while we go. SRSD and writing has been refined since that early. You can read ahead of me. There are now over 100 studies across experimental, quasi-experimental, single case design, qualitative, by various researchers, and now in 10 countries that we know of. Grades 2 to 12 and adult learners, general ed and special ed. Here's a confession, and this one is aimed especially at your early career doc folks. SRSG research has not been well funded. This is myth. I know people say, oh, it's just another SRSD grant, or this, this, this poster, this is probably because they had lots of money and they had all the... No, look, year of degree, 1980, year of first SRSDs published, 1985, 32 years of ongoing non-stop SRSD research and only eight years of specific external funding for SRSD. And that first grant was mostly math and reading. We had a fraction of the money to spend on writing, and we had to develop handwriting, spelling, and genre strategy, uh, one area of genre strategies for that fraction of the money. You guys, funding is great, funding is good, but funding alone doesn't create good research, and excellent, outstanding research can be done without funding. How could we do it? Our doc students and the teams we put together, including masters and undergraduate students, what you need is people, what you need is collaboration, such as the uh, study that was presented here in the poster session this year, led by Julia Houston uh, and Angelique Aiken and Ashley Markell, right here, part of that research team. That's how the work has been done. The people doing research in, in 9 and 10, 11 other countries also are not, for the most part, funded. It is instead driven by passion. It's been researched by multiple teams. It's been declared an evidence-based practice by four groups. What does the database tell us? It changes how kids write. It changes what kids write. It changes efficacy, attitudes, and attributions. And we do get generalization. And the theory that has most informed us in getting transfer or generalization, gas, is behavioral theory. And if you don't know the behavioral theory, Research and research on generalization and transfer, including Stokes and Bayer, and Teach, Don't Hope and Pray. You need to go read that work. It's wonderful. Let's look at what a recent meta-analysis shows us uh, across the quantitative studies. Uh, these are all experimental studies. So for the assessment point of post-test, and this is merging genres, we have an effect size of 1.75 an elements improvement of 2.24, length of 0.47. And length will commonly have a small to no effect size in our studies because length is not a goal. Our initial goal is to get kids writing better, not necessarily writing more. Some kids learn to write better and also write more. Some kids wrote a lot, they just sort of what Pat Alexander calls threw up on paper, but it was terrible. So when they write better, it becomes shorter. When we look at the maintenance, we get 1.3, 1.4, and length, nothing. Again, if we want length to improve, we're probably going to have to work on length, teach kids how to expand and say more. Part of the problem with having little funding is that we've done no longitudinal research. Almost all of our SRSD studies are beginnings, and there would be so much more we could do if we could 
could stay. Now, teachers are going way beyond beginning, and I'll be able to share a little bit of that with you in a moment. At generalization, 1.1 for quality, 1.5 for elements, 0.46 for length. This is near genre generalization. The genres, and, and most people don't know this, or inaccurately, incorrectly state the opposite, the genres are relatively independent in performance. Children who can write good stories cannot necessarily write good arguments, nor can they necessarily write good informative text. In fact, mostly there is a very low correlation. This is generalization theory in writing. If you want them, I can send you several recent studies showing the independence of genres among children and adolescents. So we can't take for granted that teaching one will help the others. So let's take a quick look at pre-post SRSD. This is an average second grader, a seven-year-old, right? Now, we don't ask yes-no prompts anymore. This one is going a ways back. Now we say, think about, decide what you believe and write. But we asked, should parents give their children money for having good grades on their report cards? And I want you to look at what this seven-year-old has going for her. What's the handwriting look like to you? How about the spelling? Yeah. Punctuation? Some evidence? No, because parents aren't supposed to give money for their report cards and their grades. Okay, that's what knowledge dumping, right? Or spell. Why the first thing that comes to mind, write it down, dump. About 12 lessons later, collaborative writing, uh, gradual release of control, we said, should teachers give student grades? Let's look at what she wrote. Yes, I think teachers should give students grades. First, kids need it so they can see if they got 100. Second, it would be much more. Easy if you give students a grade. Finally, teachers would be proud of themselves if they give kids a grade. That's when teachers should give students grades. The end, I have all my parts. <laughs> we get this a lot, especially from the little ones, because they've learned to monitor. We do a lot of self regulation. I'm going to quickly show you some of that. I'm going to pick up the pace here to do that. Let's look at Paige, a fourth grader with LD. Should children have to go outside for recess? She's also described by her teacher as really disliking writing and avoiding writing. You know, she'd go to the pencil sharpener 14 times. No, because kids need to be inside in storms and achy wet weather. Also, to stay warm and cozy. Yes, because it might be really hot. Also, it might not be too cold. Does she even have an opinion? <laughs> she doesn't. Now, this is tight for you because handwriting and spelling and punctuation were also problems for her. They're corrected here for us to read easily. In her post-test, only handwriting and spelling are corrected. Here's her post. <clears throat> Oops. Oh, yeah, there's Should kids be paid to go to school? Listen up. Effective opening? We work hard on effective openings and grabbing the reader. We never did that one. I was in this classroom. ASCD videotaped this classroom from beginning of instruction to end and produced an hour video summarizing uh, the references at the end of the PowerPoint if you want it. She must have got that at home. Can you imagine being at home and mom or dad's going, listen up! <laughs> kids should get paid for going to school. My first reason is that they'll do their work better because if kids don't get paid, they won't do their work. Another reason is that kids work hard to learn. If kids really work hard to learn, they earn cash. My last reason is that if kids are paid to go to school, they can use the money to buy things that will help them learn better. Is she considering the reader? She's not talking about why she wants money. She knows this is written to the parents and the teacher. They know who their audience is. You clearly see that she has learned, as we have emphasized, to give reasons that will persuade the reader. They can, they can buy pencils, papers, crayons, books, calculators, and even more. This will be great for teachers, too, because they won't have to buy kids supplies like they do now. Now you know why kids need to be paid to go to school. 12, 30 to 40 minute lessons. Gradual release and control, a great deal of collaborative writing. I'm gonna show you quickly how that happens in a minute. Next, confession. I'm a theory junkie, but I'm still sane. I wrote a fun little paper called Paradigmatically Induced Schizophrenia. When I started in the 80s and wrote about and began publishing the early studies of SRSD and saying that it was integrative across affect, cognitive, be uh, and behavioral theories, and that it was also working to incorporate the evolving theories of uh, social cultural and uh, other uh, social learning theory was very big. People told me that people came out of the woodwork to tell me that I couldn't do that, that I was wrong, that I was on a bad track, that I would have no friends, um, and I was just stubborn enough <laughs> not to listen. But I should have been schizophrenic 
given the different worldviews and the different paradigms and the different beliefs about children, supposedly associated with differing theories. What nonsense. I believe some things, actually many things, don't belong to any single theory, and I am sick and tired of hearing that theory A, B, C, D, E, F, G is the, the theory and the only theory that believes that meaningful learning takes place in communities that are purposeful, open, just, disciplined, caring, and collaborative. I can show you that statement in the literature of every single theory in educational psychology and education today. Take this phrase. No one asks how to motivate, motivate a baby. A baby naturally explores everything it can get at unless restraining forces have already been at work. And this tendency doesn't die out, it's wiped out. Do you know what theorists wrote that? Anybody? I can't sometimes get someone who knows. That is BF Skinner. So SRSD development depends on thoughtful theoretical triangulation and integration. And this is what it means to me to be a theoretical integrationist. I reject, we reject as a group, there are some of us who are beginning to call ourselves this and we're trying to write up a little paper and maybe get the idea out there. We reject false dichotomies, student-centered, teacher-centered, cognitive, behavioral, cold, warm, no. We, uh, we treat competing theories with thoughtfulness and respect. We focus on how knowledge is constructed and instructed. That's another false dichotomy. Student-centered, teacher-centered, nonsense. That is a false dichotomy. Good learning is student-centered, but teacher-led. It is explicit, it is there are clear goals. We're in the ZPD, or we have another term for that behavioral theory, but I'll come back to that. We believe in understanding and integrating what we know across theories, methods, and paradigms, and we believe that will make us stronger and more powerful as researchers, teachers, and policy makers. We believe interdisciplinary relationships need to be built on trust and respect. I left where I was and went to ASU because we have a, we have a college of education with no departments. We have a doc program with no departments. We have specializations. All of our doc students, however, take 90% of their first two years of coursework together, and they come from every possible area of educational research and interest. Ed psych, technology, special ed, general ed, early childhood, literacy, you name it. We get 12 to 16 a year, purposefully mixed from across all these areas, and they learn and study and do a first year study and second year study together, and they work in two research teams for three years, so they're exposed to multiple theories and multiple methods. Dubin argued in his book that contiguous problem, and I love this book, he argued that contiguous problem solving where interdisciplinary efforts based on disciplinary research add up in a way not otherwise likely, but we must value and continue focused research from single disciplines or single theories as well, but we don't have anything to add. We can respect it all. So I'm going to just really race here. These, I'm going to show you, you can skim it, and if you want it, you can have it um, later. But I'm going to show you five principles that, and I'm going to show you the, at least a few theories underlying each principle. Criterion-based teaching. You know, the whole time on task and engage learning thing, we had uh, Carroll's theory and Carroll's formula. Yeah, but we seem to have forgotten about that part of the formula was that the child is engaged and has the time needed to learn. Learning was a ratio of both, not just engagement. Behavioral theory is very big on teaching to criterion, so is cognitive behavioral theory. Active engaged learning, I only picked a few theories to put here. Um, there's so many active engaged learning people in this audience, I don't need to say more. Scaffolding, again, I picked only a few theories. These are ones that have directly influenced SRSD. In behavioral theory, the term used is learner analysis, and you analyze cognition, affect, and behavior. Even when you're a behaviorist, you analyze affect and cognition and learner as well. Then you do a great task analysis, and you need to know what the task wants in affect, cognition, and behavior. Then you begin where the student is, you have clearly defined goals, and you work in progressive successive approximations to those goals, and what I just described is otherwise known as the what? The Z, P, D. Skinner and Vygotsky's concepts, when you look at them in action in the classroom, are virtually essential, are virtually similar. Focus on attitudes and motivation uh, and efficacy matters and explicit self-regulation. 
information matters. D uh, confession, I'm done changing names. Why don't you just skim that? I'm going to move on pretty quickly. I know that SRSD is not sexy. It's not grit. I probably should have come up with something much sexier, but it's been through three name changes. I'm not doing it anymore. And teachers seem to pick it up okay, so we're all right. There's a history behind each change, but I'm not going to go into it right now. Um, confession, writing doesn't develop naturally, but it can be taught. You know, I am also really tired of hearing how we don't have to teach children to talk. <coughs> Excuse me. How many of you have had a baby or multiple children? have had friends and family with babies, or have simply watched and interacted with babies in public. Every single human being who comes in contact with an infant or a toddler almost universally takes the time to engage the child in some form of learning to speak. We make sounds, we coo. Total strangers used to come up to me, coo to my little girl when I had her in the shopping cart. Uh, neighbors would come over and they would make words for my little girl to imitate. Total strangers at the grocery store, my daughter would reach out and say dad dad to a man I never saw before. <laughs> no, no, honey, not dad dad. Michael. <laughs> my point is this, there is nothing natural about learning to talk. Is there, Chomsky, is there a sort of innate drive? Are, is our brain wired to learn language? You bet. But I worked with kids in special ed in the 70s. I was in a child find program. We got a brother and sister who had been kept in the barn with the animals and had very little parental instruction, had been not ever been sent to school. We got them in, somewhere in their early teens. We don't know how old. We didn't know how old they were. They had no language except for gestures and noises they made to each other. <coughs> there is probably no more scaffolded, explicit, structured, interactive, collaborative, co-constructive learning experience in your life than learning to talk. If we could do that with everything we teach, we would teach so much better. Almost all of our research has been done in writers' workshop classrooms, almost all in Title I and at low SES schools, and almost all in diverse classrooms. We are doing uh, practice-based professional development. It takes 12 to 14 hours. SRSD is difficult for teachers to learn to do because there's a lot that's new and a lot, a lot that is different. What time am I going to? Okay, so just a few more minutes. We'll wrap it up. Okay. Um, so I'm going to go really quickly at this point. I'm going to show you some of the characters of SRSD, and then I'm going to quickly show you what the new set of strategies is that we validated recently. There's a lot of reading, there's a lot of discourse, a lot of discussion, a lot of collaboration, a lot of scaffolding. We asked one classroom about, what do you think about having to memorize the mnemonics? Not just the words, but you have to memorize what every step means and why it matters. Not just the words. And they all looked at me sort of puzzled, and then one little girl raised her hand, she said, well, how are you supposed to use it if you can't remember it? And I went, okay, we can move on now. It's only certain theorists and some adults who have trouble with memorization. Memorization in context, memorization for a purpose, and memorization done in fun ways is not ruining children. A parent comment just recently, I'm going to uh, just quit. She, she said, she talked to the teacher who had been in, uh, in SRSD training and said, how did you turn writing, which used to be like broccoli in our home, into ice cream Sundays? <laughs> it's, it's not that hard. It's 8 to 12 lessons, 20 to 40 minutes. There are still more questions than answers. This is another myth. There's so much SRSD research. Any new study is just a, another iteration. No, each new study takes a, a new goal, takes on a new task in writing, a new age, grade level, new developmental uh, issues, and a lot of the most recent research in um, SRSD now is reading and writing combined. Reading to learn and writing to, to learn and writing to show what you know. Um, there's a whole bunch of questions here if you want to look through them. One of the biggest issues is scaling up, how do we get teachers to do it. We now have a set of six studies, all experimental studies, and one qualitative on practice-based professional development for SRSD. Teachers can learn it, they can do it, but the findings, we get significance, we get effect, nice exercises, but if you look at the student level data, the findings are mixed. That McCollum study, we'll go through that in depth for you if you want. Teachers trying to teach to classrooms of 20, 25, 30 students 
have a very difficult time working with kids who read from pre-primer level to sixth grade level, which is typical of most fourth grade classrooms today. But they are trying. We need a developmental research base to inform us at SRSD. We don't have it. Reading and math, we have the developmental research to know what kids should be able to do. The common core standards in writing are based upon educated guesses. The two women who wrote them would say the same thing. I've heard them talk. There is no developmental research base in writing to tell us that those common course strategy uh, goals at each grade level are appropriate. None. We don't have it. <clears throat> SRSD is a beginning, not an ending. I'm going to quickly show you some of the artifacts of instruction and a little bit about instruction and then we'll be done. This is the, the package we've been working on the last three years. Uh, Julia Houston, who led our presentation of this yesterday, um, was our team leader on this. This is a set of strategies. How teaches you to think about topic, audience, and purpose, how to organize notes, how to write and keep thinking and problem solve. TWA, I'll come back to in a minute. That's a close reading strategy. And tree is a writing strategy. Now, you can't teach all three of these at once. We're talking about eight, nine, and ten year olds. So we broke it down. We know how to teach Powell and Tree. There have been uh, five, six, seven studies, empirical studies on Powell and Tree. So we know how to do it and do it well. So we did that. We taught kids to analyze the writing task, to think about their audience, to think about their purpose, and so forth and so on. We taught them how to make notes. This is one of the hardest struggles with young kids. Up into high school, they don't know how to make notes. They want to write full sentences, or almost full sentences, and then what do they want to do when they're done? They just want to string those together and that's their writing. And this persists into high school. Tree is a strategy for structuring a persuasive argument, an opinion essay, topic sentence, tell what you believe, at least three reasons, give detailed explanation for each reason. You can see all of Tree in Paige's essay. You can see a much simpler form of tree in our seven-year-old, in that essay. Have a good ending, wrap it up right. Here's TWA. We first taught Powell and Tree, and then we wrote collaboratively, and then the kids wrote a couple of opinion essays independently, and then we didn't go any further to full independence. Instead, we switched and began teaching this reading strategy. We told the kids, look, you know, coming up with all your own ideas to persuade someone to agree with you is fine, but what about if you could use facts? What's the difference between a fact and opinion? Where could we get facts? We introduced them to informative text, and we taught them this strategy. This strategy is initially validated for reading comprehension by Linda Mason and her colleagues. We just adapted it. You see the three steps. There used to be an airlines called TWA. How many of you yeah, so that's why it was TWA. Teachers today are calling it BWA before, while, and after because their kids don't know what TWA was. But you, you skimmed it, you see it. Let's look carefully. They don't just learn those mnemonics. They learn all of these aspects that are here. Topic, audience, purpose. A good essay is fun to write and fun to read. Be clear, be organized, make sense. Use linking words, use linking down the words or effective vocabulary. We used to call them thousand dollar words Somewhere in the 90s, one of our kids said, these words are worth a million, not a thousand. So we call them million dollars. Think about what will persuade the reader. The kids, as they work through learning how to self-regulate, one of the things they learn is effective self-talk. We have kids think about things to say to themselves to think of good ideas while they work and to check their work. I'm not going to read these to you because I don't have time. Um, I just want to show you a couple of them. I need to use Tree to help me. Take my time, just use your brain, read it again. You did use your brain. Use TWA, check your planning sheet. We teach kids linking words explicitly and they add to them. They have the sheet in their folders. We teach them never to go first, second, third. That's boring. So we use these, <laughs> they add more. We teach attention getters and we teach how to wrap it up right. This is very quickly a, one of our struggling nine-year-olds who learned TWA plus tree and POW. 
He has closely read that Orlando. He's marking text for reasons and explanations, details and big ideas. He's making notes on an organizer, a structured organizer that he creates on scratch paper, and then he writes his essay. This is the structured organizer they started with. This is how they are doing it on their own. They graph all of their collaboratively written essays first, and then they graph their independent essays. This first essay is not graphed until near the end of instruction. This was their pretest. We graph it near the end of instruction so they can see the progress that they have made. However, we have learned with some children, particularly kids with emotional behavior disorders, we can't. Those are collaborative and those are independent. We just leave out of this graph with those kids. We won't get into this, but the kids know what they're doing with the rockets and why. This was one student's pretest, and this is, again, their writing and their post, but because of time, I'm not going to read it to you. I will quickly show you our data with a randomized controlled trial last year. This is post-test. This is planning scores. Pre, mid, look <coughs> carefully at the mids, pre, mid, post. Mid is where they've done all of the modeling, all of the explanation, and they've initiated collaborative practice, just initiated. How much improvement are we getting? There's a little, but it's nothing compared to what the collaborative co-construction of the writing process and the use of strategies for writing and self-regulation give you over time. This, Barbara Rogoff, so many other people, Mickey Chi sitting in this room, talk about collaboration, the power of the group mind, working together, the learning that goes on there. We had independent writing with no help whatsoever. After that process, this is what we get in planning. Kids know how to plan. Well, I hope we get better writing. Here it is. Quality, pre, mid. I mean, that mid isn't too bad. But thank goodness we didn't stop. Look where we are at post. Genre knowledge, reading scores, and then I'm going to quit here and just say that attached to this is a more detailed explanation of all the stages, as well as print, video, and online resources. These two organizations I have no financial relationship with, both have got just awesome websites on SRSD with teacher video, student video, all kinds of pre and post examples. So if you want to know more, there's a lot out there so that you can learn.